You might recall that when we did the one of the first uh, applications of this formalism in this chapter, we looked at the Newton's second law in a frame that was accelerating with constant linear acceleration. And we ended up with an inertial term that was minus the mass times the acceleration of the, of the accelerating frame as an inertial uh, force that showed up in when you analyze the, the equations in the non-inertial frame. We're now hoping to do that for a rotating situation. We've got uh, Newton's second law. We want to write it in a frame that's rotating with constant angular velocity omega. And we want to identify the associated inertial forces. So uh, again, when we're thinking about the inertial frame looking like this, those guys are, are not rotating with respect to the fixed stars. And then we've got a rotating frame. with um, angular velocity that's constant and out of the board. But in fact, the formalism is much more general than that. It doesn't have to be, the angular velocity doesn't have to coincide with the z-axis, which is out of the board. That'll get you in the right mindset. This is Newton's second law as expressed in the inertial frame. This is just force, sum of forces is mass times acceleration. And we've written this acceleration that we normally would have written as A or R double dot in this way to make sure that we're distinguishing between where we're taking the derivatives. Are we taking them from the point of view of the inertial observer or we're taking them from the point of view of the rotating observer? And this is the inertial observer. So we know that in an inertial reference frame, Newton's second law applies. And in the last concept, uh, concept 9.5, we just wrote down the acceleration. We were able to relate the accelerations in the inertial frame and the rotating frame. And then we got two extra terms, which I didn't identify in that concept, but I'd like to identify now. This one's called the centripetal acceleration. And we saw that, that, that this one points in toward the center of the circle. And, and we did identify that as a centripetal acceleration that you know and love. But this is the vector form of it that always points toward the center. And this is a new uh, component of acceleration. That one disappeared in the uniform circular motion case. But this one's extremely important in motion on the surface of the Earth. Because as you move on the surface of the Earth, right now, my, my velocity in the rotating frame is zero. This dr by dt would be zero. But as soon as I start walking on the surface of the Earth, I've got a velocity as seen by the rotating observer. You might be sitting down, you say, I'm walking. So, that leads to really weird forces on merry-go-rounds, etc. And we'll explore some of those forces in the problems. But what I'd like to do now with you is to plug this acceleration in the inertial frame into Newton's second law. And then I would like to rewrite Newton's second law in such a way that the right-hand side looks like mass times this acceleration in the rotating frame, just like we did with the linear acceleration case. And then bring these two terms over the left-hand side, and these two terms will be the origins of the inertial forces. So, uh, substituting that into there, let's do a little bit of the math in our heads. When I put these three terms here, I have to multiply them by the mass. And I'm going to keep this term on the right-hand side. So I'll have a mass times this term on the right-hand side. And I want to take these two terms, just to save ourselves from writing, a lot of writing. I have to multiply by the mass in both cases, and then take these two terms over to the left-hand side. 
So what do we get? Sum on forces, and these are the forces as seen, like we talked about before, these are the forces as seen by the observer in the inertial reference frame. So these are forces we're all familiar with. Normal force, friction, uh, tension, uh, gravitational force, uh, Coulomb force, etc., etc. These are the ones that we know and love. That's the same thing. Then we're going to take this term, multiply by mass, and take it to the left side. All of that is supposed to equal the mass times this term. All right, that is it. That is Newton's second law in the rotating frame. These are, as we said before, the forces seen by the inertial and the rotating observers. Both observers see these forces, experience these forces. But the rotating observer feels two more forces. This one is called the Coriolis force. It is an, one of the two inertial forces that are experienced only by the rotating observer. And then this term here is called the centrifugal force. So these two forces are inertial forces seen only by the rotating observer. Um, and that's it, that's the concept. But one, one more point that I'd like to make is that a lot of times in, in introductory physics, uh, sometimes when it's taught at the high school level, even at the college level, the instructors will include the centrifugal force for rotational motion and treat the acceleration as zero. That unfortunately creates a lot of confusion in students when they, when they see it presented correctly. If an object is going in a circle, it has an acceleration because its velocity vector is changing. And so you can't just set the acceleration equal to zero and then plug in the centrifugal force. If, however, you're doing the problem from the point of view of the rotating observer, then in that case, the acceleration is zero and you do feel an a centrifugal force. So but you've got to be careful, um, and all of you being physicists, must, must be careful about what frame you're in when you analyze the problem. And one more point. This centrifugal force, what direction is it in? Well, omega cross omega cross r was toward the center of the circle. It was a centripetal or center-seeking force. 
What about the centrifugal, I'm sorry, center-seeking acceleration? That's an acceleration. This is a force. It's minus m mass times this uh, centripetal acceleration. Well, omega cross omega cross r, this bit right here, points toward the center of the circle. And if you take a vector that points toward the center of a circle and you multiply it by a minus sign, you're going to get a force that points away from the center. And that, in fact, my friends, is <clears throat> the force that you feel when you're in the seat of your car, turning left, and you feel a force toward the right. So you feel your body pulled outward. You're in a rotating reference frame because you're moving with that car that's accelerating, rotating, and that, that is a centrifugal force that pulls you outward. It only appears because you're in a non-inertial reference frame and you're analyzing it from the point of view of in a non-inertial non reference frame. Someone standing on the side of the road looks at you and they say, no, you don't experience a centrifugal force. That's just the, the negative of your centripetal acceleration that came over to the other side of the equation when we brought, it, um, we brought this term from this side of the equation over to the force side of the equation, it acquired a minus sign flipped its direction, and centripetal became centrifugal force. The uh, direction of the Coriolis force, it's a tricky one, but it is the one that's responsible for, um, for objects moving in the northern hemisphere experiencing a force toward the right, and my objects moving on the surface of the earth in the, in the southern hemisphere experiencing a force to the left. And this Coriolis force, um, uh, sharpshooters and snipers have to take that into account because over long distances and high speeds this force becomes important, especially for um, cannonballs. If you shoot a cannonball a long distance, a mile or two, you'll be off in, your, um, in hitting your target if you don't take this Coriolis force into account, as well as of course the centrifugal force.